eschatology, the study of the end of things, the judgment of mankind, and the final destination of mankind. It's a hotly debated topic that's been ongoing since the second century. Today we will discuss the study of the subject through a historic lens. During the first hundred years of Christianity, you see unanimity of two things. One, that all of the dead will rise in resurrection, and two, that Christ will return as judge of all mankind. Early on, there is a form of evidence of millennialism, a type of millennialism, that points to the parousia as being the trigger point that begins a thousand-year reign of peace. What you notice here as we go on through this video is that there is a pattern that will form of apocalyptic ideas waning and resurging, um, sometimes upon persecution, other times just upon resurgences of ideas. Initially, the attitudes against Rome, who had decimated Jerusalem in 70 AD, started to soften as Christian missionaries converted huge numbers of Roman citizens. Two attitudes expressed in the early first two centuries really went between either a building of a current time of peace that would culminate in an ultimate time of peace or a future event that would trigger an ultimate time of peace. The apocalyptic form or the future telling or date setting form of millennialism um, was largely rejected but held popularity among the Montanists um, along with other heretical groups of the time. According to Epiphanius, in 156 AD, Montanus declared himself the prophet of the Third Testament. What was his motivation for this? Perhaps power, but he was obsessed with dividing the past and the future into separate units of prophetic calculation. This eventually developed into what's called sabbatical millennialism, which posits that there would be a 6,000-year time of human history, and then the last thousand would be a form of Sabbath. Forms of this came about, were rejected, and built upon by some. It was mentioned in the epistle of Barnabas as well as Politus, but ultimately came to no real exegetical satisfaction. Origen also offered a form of metaphysical manifestation of the kingdom within the souls of the believers, um, but this also was largely discredited. Although the apocalyptic and metaphysical forms of these ideas were rejected, a part of them remained which identified the kingdom not as a physical earthly nation, but rather as the church itself. With the failures of sabbatical millennialism, it, it took the dating and times being so confusing and all of the events were passing without having occurring. It was clear false prophecies and false interpretations. So the clergy had to sharpen their pencils a bit and re-examine the text of Scripture without the mixing biases of different forms of traditions being taken in, but rather taking a look at Scripture itself. And finally, we get to Augustine. From about 400 onward, we see Augustine refuting biblically the anarchistic forms of millennialism as well as the authoritarian kind held by some like Eusebius. And how did he do it? By presenting known history and organizing it into two groups, the spiritual kingdom and the earthly kingdom. He purported the idea that the millennium in ultimate success could not be achieved here on earth, but only at the eschaton when the heavenly would come down upon the earth, the city of God. This solved and verified numerous biblical issues with the previous views, positing that a future time of perfect peace was not the answer, but rather that that time had already begun. And when did it begin? Upon the establishment of the church. This exegetical achievement dominated the next eight centuries of commentaries on Revelation and continued on in the formal uh, commentaries and debates, even through the Reformation. In Augustine's great work, The City of God, he posited that the coexistence of the secular and heavenly and Satan's reduction in power would be ultimately taken from him. These base premises are the bedrock of both the post-millennialism view and the amillennialism view today. So what proof is there that Augustine's view was right and the other ones were wrong? Well, one big thing. The world didn't end. Augustinian millennialism never tries to place a date upon the eschaton. 
Despite this, there were still those trying to place dates upon either a future tribulation or the great apostasy, the year 500 and 800 being of significance. Uh, both, of course, passed without end. Rome fell, but clearly that was not the event that some expected that it might be. During both of those 500 and 800 year um, time periods that were focused upon, there were various groups calling co Countdown to the Apocalypse, Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Gregory of Tours writes about a peasant who, after the plague of AD 591, presented himself as Christ and was outed by a woman he was traveling with who was playing the part of Mary. It was another named Theota who announced the end in 847, and though attracting a great large following, uh, yet again we have the year past proving her a pseudo-prophetess. Moving past the year 1000, in Germany, Otto III uh, released apocalyptic symbols using fear as control and using Charlemagne's tomb, asserted imperial millennialism by allying with Pope Sylvester II. But yet again, that century passed, no end. This form of imperial millennialism caused the church to act not as an authority spiritually, but more as the civil magistrate. This seed remained in parallel to Augustine's views uh, up until Joachim of Fiore in the 13th century, and futurist apocalyptic ideas again began to spread. Again, there were events through the 13th and 14th centuries that marked points that were pointing toward pieces of eschatology, people trying to view the signs of the times as being the trigger to the apocalypse. Throughout this time, we still see post-millennial ideas uh, the Augustinian form of millennialism posited still the most strongly because he pointed to scripture that no one knows the day or the hour and emphasized instead the mission of the church, which we find in Matthew 25 and 28. Although Luther did affirm most or much of Augustinian teaching, because of his biases against the Roman Catholic Church, he also held to some apocalyptic belief as well. John Calvin as well held to Augustinian belief, although he did also carry some apocalyptic ideas much like Luther, and it was his views that fueled mainly the views of the Puritans. Personally, despite agreeing with much of Calvin's teaching, this is one area that I personally disagree with him on. Despite some challenges by some of the larger names during the Reformation, postmillennialism in the form of Augustinian eschatology still remained the dominant view. During the divide of the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Reformation, biases influenced some of the writings despite on that particular topic, there was largely agreement eschatologically among all of those groups. Not only Rome, but the Anglicans, Lutherans, Calvinists, and later the Presbyterians, despite other theological differences, largely agreed on eschatology. Then we arrive at the 17th and 18th centuries, naturalism. Francis Bacon was a huge voice in the naturalism movement and directly attacked the Augustinian views, and this was really one of the first secular movements in Western history. This movement even bled into the later Jewish writings, such as the Kabbalah and other Hermetic works. The big lie was this, that man possesses God's revelation. We don't need to look to the eschaton. We can create Eden now ourselves. Throughout the 17th century, Anglicans such as Joseph Mead held to the belief that Revelation contained a historical record of the kingdom and that the second coming would not be a rescue of humanity from destruction, but of ultimate victory of Christ and his kingdom. This teaching still remained dominant until another resurgence of apocalyptic millennialism by the works of John Nelson Darby. Darby and the Plymouth Brethren, as biblical post-millennialism was diluted by ideas of nationalism and manifest de destiny and naturalism, gave rise to a teaching called dispensationalism. This idea divides history into various periods of time, similar to the Montanists in the second century, and it emphasizes the rapture, describing it as a kind of rescue instead of ushering in Christ in his ultimate victory. This form of premillennialism uh, ignores political involvement by saying that the world is too evil to carry out, even with Christ leading the church, a culmination of the millennium. Only by divine catastrophe can the millennium begin, and even then, with Christ physically on earth, 
yet another apostasy occurs. This version of premillennialism is not found in church history until this time, until the 1800s, not in the Montanist, in Irenaeus or Eusebius, or even the small resurgences of apocalypticism that we see throughout history as patterns that we've already discussed. In the West, however, this view is dominant, um, mainly because the Schofield KJV included the teachings of John Nelson Darby in its pages as the earliest study Bible and influenced specifically American pastors in the 1800s, and that has moved on even until today. In future videos, I do plan on re-examining um, the primary modern views of eschatology and lay them out, um, but I do want to uh, bring up one other point before I close here today. What we see in the consistent teaching of the Bible is that mankind has rebelled against his creator God and is in need of reconciliation with him. So Christ um, came to earth and willingly went to the cross and took the punishment for our sins that we have all earned for ourselves. And if we would believe and put our trust and repent in him, be baptized in response to that faith, we would be saved. So I urge you and implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled unto the Father. Grace and peace.